I'm amazed at the persistence. Crickets. Love being crickets. I don't know why, but that seems to be it. Every excuse, I don't understand it. Remember, silence extends to doing something not quite right. You think you're doing it right, but you end up not doing it right. You end up wasting your time. Those that know that, take advantage of that. And so, it's a pretty interesting war we're in. Not many people really want to address it. They'll complain about it. We'll all complain about all kinds of stuff. But we don't want to really hold up to it. And I'm really disappointed. I look through and see lots of things going on. And they continue to go on. And the things that I avoided a long time ago are still going on. And people haven't quite figured out that they sit in this, uh, literally, the, I can't get away from it, folks. It's an occupied state. You can put any name on it you want. It's not what you were told. It's not working like you were told. That should have been your first clue. There's not a lot of ways to get at it. There is a couple ways to get at it, but it's going to take more and more of us. The worse that it is, the more it takes. And so this is the problem behind the woodshed is to bring the principles, and one of the principles is get at, get at it. Don't, don't hang around. So today I want to uh, touch this week. Since nobody was really interested, at least in the billions of uh, potential viewers on YouTube, 22 people visited the, the link at RLM's account to listen to the straw man, the straw man weapon, uh, weaponization. And, uh, you know, I, I look at this stuff and I say, well, these are critical tools to understand. And no one wants to hear them. And I don't understand how you don't go there. You don't know what the content is, but you don't go there. And without this information, I don't know how you're going to address the very things that everyone, you all complain about. And again, I really not a judgment. This is how we are. We, we tend to want to not do a whole lot of it. We were lulled into all this system that was protecting us. You know, we forgot uh, to, to look around at nature, uh, the nature of the world, the nature of man isn't that way. It's why you have to have these constitutions in the first place, whatever you consider that con those constitutions. I don't think people appreciate that fact. If you, if you don't have some sort of semblance of a focus for people, and a restriction on, on them, they, they will not, they will, you end up having this tribal sense, which is why the UN wants to push your idea, oh, I'm, I'm with my tribe, uh, because you won't have a defense. You're going to be susceptible always to the next bigger gang, which is what these things tend out to be. So in this country, United States of America, as I broadcast out of the United States of America uh, to the world, fascinating stuff, uh, we, we are the example, the shining example of the tarnished, uh, brass knob uh, that the people were supposed to keep and they put it on us and we didn't really pay that attention uh, the republic if you can keep it was a challenge and they beat us and uh, we didn't quite appreciate that a number of times in a number of ways that when i started looking into all this stuff and watching how people were responding yeah they see it they hear it and not a lot of people want to uh they don't like it and so the, uh, there's a few quite a few that early on were, were striking out to resist it but there was always looking for the easy out or trying to fabricate things. And that's what I started to look at very carefully. You know, these look good, but they're really missing links in the chain. And as I told you, I keep telling you about this continual evidentiary thing in the world. You've you got to bring your, whether it's your title to your, your land, whether it's an evidence trail, whether it's a proof uh, that brings you to some conclusion, you have to put your links, connect up. First of all, they have to connect up, and they have to be uh, connected up in an objective way. In other words, you have to have factual, good good evidence. And then you can't put your opinion into certain things. And uh, when you do, as I can see some of these things coming down, you start want walking yourself into some trouble. Before I get off too far, I believe this broadcast for the past cast, recast, broadcast, wherever you find it, whether that's ucy.com or Real Liberty Media on the broadcaster or wherever. Oh, and uh, shout out to normalization of ignorance. I just ran across, again, looking for my own information. Where did I, I know I said something about this. Where did I put it? Look on uh, on a search and uh, normalization of ignorance on YouTube as an account, and they post uh, the broadcast. So thank you very much to whomever is doing that. I do appreciate it. It's a little bit of an embarrassment to see that your, 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 your connections, your viewership is almost as much as the one we have at RLM, though. So Again, not many people interested in, in the information on when it comes down to having to do something, people want to go be entertained. And that's just the fact of that. 
And I have to keep telling myself that because I would probably get pretty discouraged pretty quick. Mary, thank you, uh, Normalization of Ignorance, for, for reposting uh, the broadcast from, uh, from uh, I think it's also UCY TV and maybe RLM. I don't remember now, but thank you for doing that. As well, again, at Minds and the Reminds and all that stuff. Everything everyone is doing just to get the, the word out. Again, Minds is really showing its, well, its uh, strength uh, for people who want to come. It's not a lot of people, but it's a whole lot more than you, a lot of other places combined, actually. So don't, don't hesitate to go find the broadcast and send it out. And, and, and support, and thank you for the support, and thank you, uh, Cowboy Tech, I didn't get to tell you this, uh, for your support of last week's uh, broadcast. We'll try and do that again this week where I, I'll, I'll stay on the subject matter and applicable to what we'll, what we'll find once we do decide to, to, to step up. And again, you don't have to step up and be jeopardy. You, you step up when you've figured out the terrain and you can kind of sneak yourself in like they sneaked them, themselves in. You kind of use them, they're what they've done as a model. And uh, and then you use more things that uh, they have are required to respond to, as I said. Uh, that you you find out what they were taking. Their they claim that they were going to uphold, and you hold that you hold their feet to that fire. You don't make it up. Well, one thing I've been trying to suggest to y'all, <laughs> get involved with these uh, gr- these criminal jurisdictions, is you have all kinds of rights that people don't assert. But then when they do assert them, they don't they don't know what they're doing, and so they kind of get themselves in more trouble. And I want to, uh, and I'm and and this is. I'm going to go down this track this week, at least start out and finish this concept and then move on uh, to tabs maybe. Because I'm in a, a land disposal, a soil disposal, uh, my 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 studies and my research, my experience is in this pretty heavily in the last, uh, what, I don't know, 15 years now, 18, I don't even know what it is. Uh, I'm feeling, and in a, a diligent uh, research, diligent application, I'm pretty... I believe I'm fairly versed in what I'm talking about, the subject matter. So, and I think it's the law of the land, the literal land is the most important thing to start understanding. And when I researched this, I found out that the law of the land imposes upon the grantors an obligation to stop themselves from interfering. And that was probably, when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's probably the biggest thing we're going to get in, in, lieu, in light of this military consequence we find ourselves and all the mercenary public private partnerships that have sprung up since the Civil War. Uh, Link, uh, Lincoln was a lawyer. Now we've now suffered more occupational forces, which are given license to run roughshod over us as long as they maintain the pre. They keep the pressure on just enough, but not enough that it overboils, as which is your court systems are. When you start noticing all this stuff, you start realizing there's certain things that you you you, ha- you almost have to do, and it's not like you can stay away. They'll pull you in and beat you up anyway. So when I realized that, like. I mean, if it happened in the real world, I went out to the forest, I went up in the mountain, uh, I learned what I needed to learn to keep these governments at bay, and they followed me up, and I had to keep them at bay. There was, I found out there was no place I could go that these people who are somehow believe their bureaucrat opinions are more important than just leaving people alone, that I wasn't going to escape that. And I realized this globe is round, I don't care what you flat earthers think, I haven't found the other side that no one lives on, and so I'm going to have to deal with reality. And it don't matter where you are on this earth anymore. We're everywhere. You're even on my island down there. Well, get governments. Get off my island down there. Finding out some stuff I don't want you to know about. But anyway, we're around everywhere. So I figured out we're not escaping. We're in the, that's what I started to, the prison idea started to come on to me. Well, getting all beyond my observations and into application, I started to learn there were certain things in these systems, these private public partnerships that throw on you. In this case, is your just us system. Just cause, not just cause, but just cause, and the uh, exploitation system, the plunder, the pirate, piratic, pirate, uh, piratic system that, that they've invoked. Uh, there are rules that they're supposed to follow, and it's come to the point now when you don't see the rules uh, being followed, you need to understand and question that that which promised to follow the rules and didn't. Uh, that you don't. Uh, uh, well, here's an example of what you don't want to do when you have a, a right to assert, and this just happens to be with this uh, land land law stuff. And, and with this, uh, it ended up being related to the Bundy issue, which I'm going to touch on in the lawsuit side that he's going to claim, at least in his lawsuit, and I haven't had a chance to read it just from claims of the articles. The, but this Bundy issue, I've had a real problem with it overall because I look, it looks to me it's being set up intentionally or unintentionally as a stocking horse all by itself. It, it's no different in my mind at this point than, than the dapple thing. There's no dapple dapple. Uh, people are being played, duped, or just being done on purpose. And so this is what I start to see 
in this issue. I don't know what the purpose is here, what happened. I can tell you this is not the way to assert the right of allocution. I'll explain a little bit of that. And I'll, and I'll, I'll show you what happens when you uh, start to do this thing and how, for those of us that are interested, how that reflects poorly on how we'll perform, be able to perform and how they utilize these things in order to dismiss you. And so for me, this is a, I have to do a different type of analysis. It's that this pops up and how do you resolve a problem like this where someone makes a, a real mockery uh, of an assertion of a right you have? And this is what they, they, they try to do. And this is what I found out so-called patriots early on. Uh, they were earnest in their attempt to avoid, but then I noticed some people were in there to make a, a bad show, bad precedent in order to destroy all of it. And I started then to notice that the system was responsive to this. The, these things. In fact, they almost looked for them, these wrong ways to do things in order to make an imposition, impute, imputing the same logic to other people. No different than when you when you get accosted. Now, when you try to assert a, a challenge, they, they will, the cops will are told, they're told, well, throw thir- certain ideological conditions on them. Oh, you must be a Nazi. Oh, you must be a free a man on the land, a free man on the land. Oh, you must be a patriot. Oh, you must be this or that. This is where they've learned this. this is, we, we've taught them how to do this because we do dumb things when we uh, when we just want the pain to go away instead of looking at it. And, and so here's a, here's the example of a of a thing that happened in the Bundy uh, related issues. And this seems to be a theme this week, but. Uh, here it is, a plan, a Plains man sentenced from, for role in 2017 Oregon standoff. A federal judge Wednesday sentenced a man to a year and a day in federal prison for digging a trench during the armed occupation of the National Re- Wildlife Refuge in southeastern Oregon. Jake Ryan of Plains, Montana, was found guilty in March 2017 of depredation of government property. Depredation of government property. A sentence of probation and home detention seemed like head, like likely heading into Wednesday, but Ryan tried to fire his public defender, disregarded the authority of the court, and asserted the U.S. attorney for uh, for Oregon, Billy Williams, brought false charges on behalf of an imaginary friend, the United States of America. United States Court Judge Anna Brown described Ryan's statements as, quote, gibberish and agreed with Prosecutor Ethan Knight to impose a prison term. Moreover, she ordered Ryan to start serving the sentence immediately, so he was taken up and brought in. Well, you have the right of allocution at the point of sentencing, folks. This is not the way you do that. And I'd like to just go through it. I can't, I'm can't. i not going to say this is the definitive point. I'm saying there's a different way. that If, if he was going to, I'm going to approach this that he wanted to uh, to assert these things. Uh, that 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 was the reason why he had the right uh, the out- right of allocution is the right to say okay you got your conviction but this is why you can't sentence me there's some fundamental foundational principles here that uh, mitigate or eliminate your ability to sentence me and remember you always have the right to challenge jurisdiction at any time and that's one of those points let me go through this for those of you paying attention to all this how this works and uh, I'm not again not definitive but just an observation on how better to better to approach this kind of thing and prepare. So he says he tries to fire his public defender. Uh, well, tries. Apparently he never did. And apparently he didn't give, remember the Mumford uh, issue last year, the actual so-called attorney uh, who did not give a reason for the objection? That's the problem here. Now, this short story may not tell us all, but the point being, when you're told that you're speaking gibberish, there has been no evidence that can counter that statement by the judge who wants to put you in prison anyway, who wants to agree with the uh, with the prosecutor. You have to set the record a lot better than just to claim uh, that you have to fire the public defender. There has to be some very substantial things that you would name, one of which is also what he tried to do. But he doesn't pre- present it that way, apparently. And again, I can only do by the, new, the notice here, the news of what's going down. Uh, but if you look carefully, they're setting up. Anybody speaks like this is going to be shut down, so you won't, and you won't really think to do it better. So he said uh, there was also an allegation of the disregard of authority of the court, but that's my question. Did he properly, as I was talking to you last week, did he properly assert the right remedy to challenge the authority so that he didn't have any authority to regard? 
In other words, did he file, as I would have put it, in a quo warranto to challenge the jurisdiction of that officer, that court, its venue, its jurisdiction over the person, over the subject matter, uh, the establishment of the USDC court itself is, I know the statutes, and I said to misstate it again, I don't know why this number 88 gets stuck in my head, but the 28 USC uh, section 81 is where you start looking. 88 happens to be the Washington, D.C. court, all the way up to about 132 or so. Uh, you'll find, if you do the research inside and then find the court cases that respond to this case, that the USDC courts, such as uh, Oregon or Nevada or any of those uh, uh, courts like that, are not actually Article Three courts. So they have you in an Article One or Four court, at least, maybe even a two. It depends on. I mean, I mean, they don't want to respond to this, so they go default. And that's fine with me if I go if I set it up. But uh, he wants to say he disregarded an authority that he never challenged to show that they didn't have, uh, that he could re- disregard. So this is, if he was going to do a, a, an allocution, he would, would have had to present what the, what the attorney failed to do in his defense. And it would have to be really foundation, found very substantial. Well, not challenging the authority of a court that you have the proof shows that they may not have jurisdiction and you filed the quote warranto that they may and more likely be in default is a very substantial thing that isn't in disregard of an authority. They can't even make the claim. It does show that the attorney was not pre- presenting at least that. There may have been other things in, in the prosecution of this that caused this gentleman to agree to this sentence because I don't, I think this is just in a, a plea bargain. Uh, you didn't, he didn't attack the plea bargain as being unconscionable based on this other thing and then bring up the, uh, the evidence that you didn't know, the, the unknown, known, an unknown evidence that was known by the prosecutor that could have been exculpatory to you. That's another reason you throw out. Now, if you get the gist of what I'm saying here, you have to come with a, with a substantial thing when you go to this point of the right of allocution. You just try to assert it. So then he moves on to make it even more mythical. He talks about that the attorney brings false charges on behalf of an imaginary friend, the United States. That's not the way to challenge that. You might think that a corporation is an imaginary, but they're tools. I tell you, they're weapons. That's what these—they're weapons against you. So they exist, even as as the, as made up and fabricated as they are. And you have to address that fact. And I said, don't ever deny an authority that has even the name of it can come after you. That's what happened here. That's not the right way to assert, a, assert your allocution rights against this this entity or this attorney. A challenge to the authority of the court would have probably eliminated the attorney's ability to do that. Whether or not the United States of America is a is a friend, imaginary friend, is all how you would have presented it. The point is, did it did that a so-called imaginary friend, whose system you're looking at and you're being in there with the ability to put you in the cage, you're saying is imaginary is gibberish. I've told you better to acknowledge that thing that has the right to harm you and show how it's invalid as against you. Well, what are you thinking, folks? What do you, what do you, I talk. What do you think? What do you think about here? I mean, there's a lot going down the United States of America track. Why wouldn't he just move back to the United States? It's the United States that charged him. It was the government that charged him. The United States of America is a different, a slightly different place, isn't it? It's not the government of the place. So he's charged by the government of the place. So that was not right in the first point. But I don't know what the sentence was, and I don't know if he was going to, he was ever going to be charged fines and fees and taxes that would come out of money, so-called, these FRNs. As soon as there was an allegation that he was going to have to pay a sentence of money or dollars or whatever the heck they want to call it, I would have addressed this whole thing, not as an imaginary fund, friend, but as the corporation we all know. I would have asserted at a right of allocution that the one who was demanding the money through the judge was only a corporation. Where do you find that? It wouldn't be my opinion. No, I have to cite the law. This is why I say you get integrated with what they've they've built up that they have to agree to. Where is that, folks? All of you all that do all the studies should know. Whenever they use a financial con- con- consideration regarding a fine and fee and tax, by definition under the judicial rules or the judicial code for the United States government, that United States entity is a corporation. Where do you find it? Not my opinion. Not yours. It shouldn't be your opinion. We shouldn't work on the myth and, and fairy tale of things. You find it at 28 U.S.C. 3002. All right? So that should have come. I'm hoping I, I, I stall a little bit. I want you all to be working on this information and know the answers are right there. And I would have asserted that. Not that the United States of America was a fictional 
imaginary friend. No, the government that's opposing it, that's demanding money, is doing it through it as a corporation, not the sovereign government. And then I say, plot. now I get to move into the fact that they don't have title to the land. And if you go back to the Malheur thing, they, nobody had title to that. The government didn't have title. The title of the land was not in the land. It was in the middle of the water around there that was to the United States government. What am I doing now? I'm back to the law of the land and the water. Now, who has what? It's all written down. And I get to attack the jurisdiction of that court again on the subject matter because the subject matter actually was not a federal issue. It was actually a state issue, wasn't it? Just like I've been telling you all this. Anyway, so I won't go on and on. There's lots of stuff that he could have covered here. He wouldn't have done it as a, as a dialogue. He would have done it as a presentation of proof right in the, from the statutes and the documents that would have shown that what he said could have been rephrased just a little bit and done exactly the same thing, and now he would have made a record of the right of his assertion of the allocution that was substantiated in law and as a, in part, as the putting the burden on the system to prove it wasn't. Not by what you're doing because you impose it, but because the tool you chose imposed it. The obligation was within the law that imposed it, not you. You're not going to do anything in these courts. You're going to expose that there's things that they're not doing. You're going to expose they fail to do their duty. And we can go on, and I mean, it's on and on. When they start, when you got that, that domino starting to flow, that row of dominoes falling, you can go ahead and keep running with it. You, you want to get your day in court? You can take up a whole day in the right, asserting the right of allocution if you know what you're really doing, and it's a case like this where it's so broad. So, I guess my point is, is that there's ways to do things right, and there's ways to do things wrong. There's ways to think about stuff and, uh, and just blurt it out and, and be shown to be someone who just speaking gibberish or to set the record that that can't be put on you. And I've been asking people for over a decade to stop being the one they tell you is doing gibberish, frivolous, nonsense, all this stuff they tell us. How do I know to look at that? Because I saw people coming up, did exactly the same thing. I said, well, I'm not going to go in there and do that. And then I'd find a principle in law, so called, even though it's not being recognized, but that they agreed to. That's how you get the point is because it's, because that's what you, that's what the witness is. The witness is the law and then you're using it. That's two witnesses makes a fact. But, and then they don't answer it and you can impose the duty not by you, by the law. Now we've got a real, real situation of record that needs to be done. So this is not the right way. Uh, the, he got, he, and he paid an extra penalty for it from maybe home detention and whatever. Now he's going to sit, sit in, in jail for over a year. I don't know who talked to him. I don't know where he got this idea. I don't know when they talked to him, how he thought that was going to be sufficient. But you see now that it sets a bad precedent. And this is my main concern with all of this stuff. That's why I'm so careful. And I tell you, when I tell you about the gun handing you a gun, like it's like me handing a gun to a child, this is the type of stuff, if you're not paying attention, that happens. And I don't think he's guy, whoever this, whoever he got this information, Nobody understood what they were dealing with here. And I'm to the point where I, we talked for so long about how to do it better and more right, and no one listens. I don't know what to say. I'm, just, I'm really disappointed. Uh, I certainly don't like in what I hear. I don't think this is fair to him. And I know that the, the government took advantage of this. You, you know, you see, the judge went right to the, right to the prosecutor. The prosecutor didn't say, oh, wait, okay, well, this guy kind of went off the deep end a little bit here, but we agreed that it would be home detention. To do justice, that was all we needed. No, they made it, they, they made it more difficult because they have an agenda they're pushing to make these kinds of outbursts something that are not uh, treated and, and uh, right and then vilified. See, the judge had a higher standard to do here as well. No, immediately you see they go together. They're agents in the same system. And that, to me, I wouldn't argue about that. I just make sure that if they went to do that, they're going to have to do it against a formidable record. It showed they violated a whole lot of steps to get there. Does it fix the problem for me? Maybe not, but at least I have a record, and I get to show people who are looking in what happened. This is what this system has gotten so bad, there's nothing you can put forward. Unless you do it like what happened in the Bundys in Nevada, and, uh, and the fact, again, that they were required, there was a requirement on the government to hand somebody something, and they failed, and that was considered, and I keep pointing this out to you, you have to, your decision, your discussion, your objections have to turn strictly on due process violations. That's about, I think, the only thing that we have. It's reduced. They've got this thing reduced down. That's the only thing that they really, really, really have to pay, pay attention to. And they're carving away a little bit at that. 
But when you do it wrong, you allow them to over to regard disregard that point. When you set the record, they can't. And that's one of the only things. So in Nevada, they said, wait a minute, this Brady decision requires that you give this information. And that blew the lid off the house of cards they had. I hope you follow what I'm saying here, folks. There's a different way to approach this whole thing. I think if uh, if I'd have known about this a little bit more, not if I'd have known how he thought he was going to go about it, I would believe my last my last few minutes of discussion with you would have uh, caused him to re reassess what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. He would have walked into that court with all the rules and laws that he needed in order to assert the fact that he of what he thought he wanted to do, and he would not have been said to be calling gibberish. And if, because of the judge, when he did that, and the judge said that, you have her for not being impartial. And certainly now when he jumps to the to the prosecutor. So you're seeing you're seeing that, that right in front of your face, you're seeing the truth. You're looking at the truth, whether or not you have the eyes to see. I don't know. A major failure was taken advantage of. The guy who thought he was asserting his rights at an allocution, well, he even understood he was doing this. This is what he was. This is what the court was receiving. And he didn't back it up. He didn't, and he went after the wrong arguments. This is one of the main things I've told you over and over. Do not disregard the existence of a thing that's out there that can muster the people to have the power to hurt you. And this thing called the United States of America is one of those things. The United States is one of those things. They're different, but they're the same, if you will. Now, you get at them differently. One more quick thing before I go on to the Bundy Bundy problem now. The bad precedent-setting issue, I guess. And uh, Vince asked me to do a title for this broadcast. He did it last night. It's just not coming to me. I'm not. I'm not real happy with what I'm seeing. So my na- I have a negative titling connotation right now. So I wish I could tell you something about how this, what to title this broadcast ahead of time, or to th- how to think about this. But we have some real prob- precedent-setting problems right that we're facing. It. And all the people that think they're they have a right and a proper and a patriot and upstanding the constitution, standing up and protecting the earth, protected by the constitution, don't really have a clue. They don't have a clue how this all works. I only have the clue I got, and I can only give that to you all. And so everyone who does it wrong, they get taken advantage of. And this is what my problem with this uh, this issue and with coming up with Bundy. Getting back to this issue, there's a lot of ways to approach this to get done what he wanted to do that didn't turn out and eliminate their ability to call it gibberish and make a story up like he's talking in fairy tales. They love, they look for this stuff. They love it. They love it because it diminishes everybody else. So I'm here to uh, rally the troops around this problem. To me, this is clearly within the rules for them to do when he approached it this way. It may not be justice, but that system's not justice. And so to me, it, I don't have this problem Oh, look what, you know, no rights, no constitution, no this and that. You know, no, you didn't start with one, and we abandoned it to begin with uh, after a while, and now and now we're into this condition that no one understands, and yet so we, we want the pressure off, and so we do what we think we do. And at that point, I can't judge what you think you need to do, but I've been here long enough that people should spread the word about how you're going to have to do it better. You have to have at least in your mind the basics of the rules of evidence. If you have an objection, you better have the proof for it. It shouldn't be an argument. Why is that so hard to figure out? And that rule fits everywhere. Start as an investigative reporter, the who, what, where, why, what, but what, where, why, when, all that stuff. Keep those notes and then, and then have any objection you have, you have, you have a substantial reason why. Not just because you think so. So moving on now, this is a, again, the Bundy thing has been a real kind of a festering thing. And it's, and it's starting to gain momentum on the negative side while everybody thinks that the Bundys got out and it happens and they did get out and all this. I've showed you how that wasn't justice and that they, uh, the cat box cover-up was done by the judge again. But now Bundy moves on. We heard the news that Bundy moves on. And this is another thing I want to point out. I'm only going to respond to the news articles in quotes that were taken from Bundy suing now. He's moving on quickly. And I'm not saying that moving on quickly is a problem. And I'm not saying that trying to do this is a problem. It's how you do how you support and how you do what you do, what you bring to this is an opinion more than what the law would provide. That becomes the problem, that when you move too fast and you have the wrong idea, you're going to set a bad precedent and make it difficult for people uh, like myself, actually, and those I work with, in order to get the the proper ad- assertion done so that it won't be disregarded. Now, the only thing that saves us is that because we can come from the law, 
But we don't, we, I told you this before, language and the language you use in approaching your problem becomes the difference. And that, and there's a chasm between what I'm telling you to do and what most people tend to do. And so that we're going to maybe, and it's getting, it's getting more difficult as we move, as they learn, is this a criminal amoeba, this bacteria that call, they called those in government, uh, starts to understand and modify itself to what we do. They they really can't jump the chasm of proper language, and and I learned that a long while back, and that's been our protection. So that's why I keep telling you about focusing on this. As I just told you, if you go after the right, more proper language, and uh, the, you could Ryan could have done a whole lot whole lot better than than what he, what he did. Uh, in fact, he could have had that hearing postponed and and some other things uh, just to get the issues uh, straightened up. And, and, or put himself a formidable re- response in uh, in either of the collateral attacks. It doesn't end because they when they wrongly put you in in jail, you can bring those through a habeas corpus. That's a collateral attack. Another writ, uh, they join you from the rights so of what they did under the color of authority. You got all these other powers that start to come up when you do the record right. They're not going to tell you it's gibberish when you start popping that in there. So uh, B- Bundy, uh, Clive and Bundy, is going to go after the federal government uh, and going to assert a, a lawsuit and an action in order to do something. And that came up news. And I, I'm not really that interested in this uh, issue because I I'm, I have problems with how they're they're doing it. I think the attorneys uh, are really a problem. I can't prove intent or whatever because I'm not there. I can't see it. I always have a problem when I have an attorney that's like sitting right up next to some defendant uh, while they talk. Uh, like we're looking at a gatekeeper. We're looking like, it's looking like a handler. I have a problem with that. And, and and so all these little pieces of information sit there. I told you possibilities and probabilities and uh, coincidences and uh, do they have meaning? You put those all in a big question, but they start to formulate the concepts of that you need to put into your computer to figure out what might you be up against. That uh, this law, uh, this soil disposal law, is really kind of cut cut and dried. And I've told you a long while back, and this came and hit me because it, uh, because I tried to get this sideways. I didn't go and get the some of the things I tried to make up what I couldn't see in some of the documentation, and I hit this thing sideways, and I ran into my own conundrum. I ran into a conundrum in one of the documents that I think that they're using, and it didn't make any sense. And I've told you a long time ago, when you get into land disposal priorities and, and what, how it works, when you come up to a, a conundrum within a disposal, you've misinterpreted or you didn't get a piece of information that will answer it. And this happened to me. Because what I do is I take the people's assertion and I don't call them a, I don't say, oh, they're, they're counter to what I believe and they're wrong. What I say is, well, let's, let's give air to it. Let's prove it out the way they think they're proving it out and let's look for if they have a better idea. That's how I typically approach this. And so I wasn't interested in all this before this week because I've had so many other things that we're dealing with uh, more important that we're advancing in the way we think they should go that are more, we think are more proper in different areas on different things. And so that's what I focus my attention on. But this is becoming a problem because, well, when I start getting emails, and lots of them, people asking me to look at this or did you know about this thing? And I know half of them are looking to see how we, what do we think about this? And then we get into a dialogue after I engage. Then I know we have a, we have a thing, I, a thing we need to, I, I need to find out about a little bit better. This was the issue. Clive and Bundy wants to sue. It ends up being what they call a a, a quiet title action. You kind of got to look through these stories. These, these stories seem to be these reports are kind of poorly written, at least to my to my understanding of how these things. When they throw in too many things, they go from one point, they interject information to another another issue going on. Like this this action was in, commingled with all the bad stuff that happened in the trial. They, they, these two shouldn't have been in the same story. It doesn't matter because when you're talking about the quiet title, the subject matter is title. It's not what the government did wrong in another case. Case by case basis as well. So again, if a patriot so called, someone who thinks they know the Constitution, they know all about process, they know all about what they're doing, they know better than me, they know better than everybody else, and they start doing it like that, it's going to fail. It's going to fail because you didn't look at the foundation. And this is what I want to point out for all you all that have been paying attention and kind of understand everybody I must listening to me has a land they live on that's controlled by these rules or this that lineage of heritage and how you're going to look at whether or not you, what right you have or don't. It's, it's fascinating to, to look at all this. Everyone has a different right. I don't, like I've told you, 
You can have two people on the same piece of land or adjacent, and their rights will become, can be completely different, and how you approach them is completely different. That this is one of those issues. And Cliven Bundy has been on record that he says the state owns the land. He says the county owns the land. The people own the land. And I'll tell you the truth. I'll just put it up front here. I was shocked to find out in the principal documents he's relying on that I could find. It doesn't say that. It's worse than maybe most other states. And I'll maybe touch that later about why. And you have to understand when this happened. And you'll understand again what happened in Lincoln's time. That'll be a little clue. His condition is a uh, in a story I think I found on WND.com. And uh, we, I don't know if I, how much I want to read it. It's just that he's going to have a, he's going to assert this uh, quiet title. He wants to quiet title and, and declare, declaratory judgment that the title of the land is in the state and the county and that he derives his, his power through that. And so a couple of you sent emails and asked me about that and I sent back my observation and it was not studied at all. I've done a little more study and I see even more clearly there's a big, big, big problem. Uh, with this. The precedent that's going to be set by this, I think, through what I'm going to tell you today, and we're going to do this today together, uh, is a very bad precedent. And so now I'm turning to who? Who's running this bad precedent? To me, this looks like a stocking horse. Now, Cliven himself, it's not the stocking tortoise, it's the stocking Bundy. They're using him as a, uh, I think these attorneys do it, this philosophy this, this ideology of state-owned land and the right to land came through another attorney in Utah. He's going to watch us focus around all the attorneys coming out of Utah on this, asserting this ideology of the state needs to own the land and control the land. It's false. I've told you, Ken Ivory started this setup, the solution revolution. I've talked about it before. It's no revolution and it's no solution. It is a solution to the point of the divestment of the power of the land uh, from the people. That's where the solution, remember, uh, Hegelian dialectic, they have an outcome they want, and the attorneys know to do this. And this is the same Ken Ivory that told me when I had confronted him with six problems, flaws in his solution. I, I, he told me, yeah, you're right. They don't teach us lawyers this land disposal law. Okay, so this is the source of all this information I can tell, and I'm um, clear with that. I went and qualified a lot of this with some of my colleagues and this sounds just like this, and we all concurred that it all comes from the same Utah state attorneys who have agreed that they don't weren't taught, taught land disposal law. And I'm going to show you it's not that difficult. So let's get to it. The story here says that uh, the claim is, uh, the complaint points out, points out that the legislature, and quote, uh, the legislature of Nevada has never consented to allow the United States government to own at least 85% of the land within Nevada's borders. And the intent of the territorial legislature, and this is very critical, The territorial legislature was offered the opportunity to become a state and become the state of Nevada. There are two different things going on through the document of the Enabling Act. And so the intent of the territorial legislature was not to cede the land to the United States government forever, but to clear title of all unappropriated lands with the territory so United States Congress could dispose of the lands to the state. That's a commingling of two separate ideas. The purpose and intent for the United States government to get the title was to divest the state of all, all interests forever. The state. Because the people realized that if the state holds any interest or that it, it can still dispose, it can retain what they would call in the future as a reserved interest without notice. And so this uh, taking over of the United States as a separate government of the title was to clear that. That part looks to be true. It's not true that they didn't cede the land to do it. You had to. Now, and there's a third, there's a third question which, which we've been regarding how long that was supposed to take. Now, that's going to be up for air. I'm not talking about that right now, but that's not relevant to our discussion. So he makes a misstatement, and I want to focus on the word forever here, and that the unappropriated lands are the ones that are dealt with, and it doesn't stack to an intent in the law. We're going to hit, hit all the documents. There's a few documents that they rely on uh, about this. And we're going to point out, I want you to remember these words, because we're going to go back and find them in other documents, because they're there. And we're going to find out whether or not either Clive and Bundy or the attorneys understand what they're dealing with. And you can make the assessment of whether or not you see this going as a setup for a takedown. 
This also states in here as a quote from the, the, the complaint, asking for a declaratory judgment to declare the lands of the, that are down in Nevada to be state lands, county owned, county this, county that, uh, by, and derivative to the people. Uh, it says, as a man who is lawfully acquired, I'll read again, a quote, as a man who has lawfully acquired grazing, water, and other rights to the Nevada and its subdi- subdivisions, Clark County public lands in question, and a man dependent upon Nevada's and Clark County's lawful rights to the land, the petitioner is entitled to an order quieting title to Nevada and its subdivisions. In order to protect petitioner and the Bundy's branches rights to graze and water, another highlight I put up for myself here, uh, to the cattle of the land of Nevada. All right, so that's what's supposedly in the complaint that's written in this article in quotes. Now let's go look at the at what what we have to work with. The states, and, and this is again, I have to. I'm going to preface all this. This is we put this together this way as I'm telling you now because that's what I put it together to understand how this is. We have to go to the beginning. In the beginning of the state was before it was a state, when it was a territory of people who, uh, under the Constitution, had the right to uh, petition the Congress to become a state. And as I said, the Congress allowed it, and then there was a process, and things happened, and eventually, in 1864, this become this Nevada, state of Nevada uh, is, is created from the territory, the people of the territory, given the right by Congress. You have to understand the authority here, and who's, uh, who's the chief here in this whole in this tribe. It ain't the people. And I've told you this all a long time ago. I even had this misconception. The states were all powerful. And somebody in Arizona who had done, who was ahead of the game on this and started looking at it through his son told me, you're looking at it wrong. The state had no power. They were given the permission by Congress. And when you orient your mind that way, you're going to start seeing everything starts to make more sense in what you read. And he was right. And because of he has been right. I say it today to tell you that's the way you have to look at this. The people of the states have no power. Congress is what guided it. And in, Oregon, in Nevada, you're going to see a really interesting statement that's not in a lot of other states. As strongly acknowledged and recognized and agreed to by the people of Nevada. That uh, you, again, will hear and you can make your decision whether or not when you see these things whether they add up to the fact that Nevada and the state of or, uh, state of Nevada, Nevada, state of Nevada as a title, or the county has any right to the land at all, or the unappropriated lands at all, we're going to see this now. We go to where? We go to the beginnings of the state, and I want to call your attention to their enabling acts. The uh, their enabling acts. It's the uh, I think it was 1864 on on this. Yeah, an act of Congress, 1864, enabling the people because they weren't enabled before of Nevada to form a constitution and state government. What I find really interesting here, they don't talk about the territory from which this is, except that it's discussed in the uh, document. And so you have this condition of implication. When you start a state and a government, it's implied there will be a territory. Okay, so now we have express and implications working within a contract. These are treaties, actually. They're, They're agreed to by the power. They're agreed to between the people as the government. They're signed over and agreed to by all the uh, governmental officials that have any power to do this, and then that's overseen uh, eventually at some point by the jur- uh, judicial branch if it becomes a question. If it's never a question, uh, then it's uh, deemed ratified and, and correct. And until it's challenged in the proper way, it stay, it's, that's the presumption. And you can see how. But uh, uh, se- Part 3 makes this statement in the, from the people in their offer to Congress to be accepted as a state. That third, that the people inhabiting said territory do agree and declare that they forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands lying within said territory, and that the same shall be and remain at the sole and entire disposition of the United States. Now, it goes on to say more, but it's a semicolon. It's a qualification on who, which becomes important because it really, it, there's another implication of who this land gets dis, dis, disposed to. The disposition goes to what they call here the land that belongs to the citizens of the United States. 
sitting there already and after. And, I, and so you have to understand, don't jump. I would ask you not to do the jump, oh, that's the, that's the citizen of the United States, that's the servitude. Well, no, it can't be because you can't take land as a, uh, if you are a property, if you're a fiction, <laughs> is there men and women can only do this. So this is a different, actually a different status right here. And when you understand grant law and relationships and powers, you'll understand what I'm saying without me going, all right, I don't want to lose the focus on this. But the disposition, which is forever agreed and declared and disclaimed by the people of Nevada, by the state of Nevada, uh, is in their enabling it. So that starts, that's the authority. I don't know what else more to say about that. The people of Nevada forever disclaim any right and title interest to the property, the lands within the, the state, uh, the territory of the state, uh, and to uh, the disposition right absolute of the United States government. So what I also noticed was another statement in the report, I don't know if I copied this over, was that they were made a claim, and I was trying to track down, again, from the top down, what's the lineage of the authorities in the state? Well, inside the article, they point to an act of Congress in 1866, which changed the borders of the state. And underneath this act, they're saying, and in the paperwork that they talked to here, uh, the the article on the WND, that they make the claim that it would forever relinquish the land to the state, this statute in 1866. When I read that, I said, wow, that's an important statute. Let's go find it. There was no, no, no indication of exactly what it was. So here I'm at a little bit of vulnerability to continue, but I'm going to do it in nonetheless because I think I did find it, and I think it's the one. And uh, Vince uh, easily, uh, I asked him if he could find it. And we haven't, he, uh, thank you for trying before the broadcast. But So this is what we're going to run on what I found. What I found is an act of May 5th, 1866. And this is an act concerning the borders of the state of Nevada. Not the territory, but the state. So we already know now it's existing. It's after 1864 as well. It's just a couple years later. What I find interesting in this time period during the Civil War, uh, things happen pretty quickly. Remember, 18, in, June, in June or July, on July 26th, 1866, is the load law. So this is a bunch of stuff happening. And so you have to take all this into account, too. What was going on with these grants? Why were they making these grants? And what were the purposes? And what now was reserved and what was disposed? And all these things start to make the bigger picture of how this works. But let me get to the act that Clive and Bundy and his attorney, or his attorneys, have agreed, give the state the power that re- vanquished, eliminated all claim by the United States of America was this act. And I don't know how much I want to read. I want to cut through a couple of it, though. Let me start at the beginning and then jump through. I'll have a link to all this stuff you can, on the blogcast. You can read it yourself, and I, I ask you to because you'll see what I've been saying about how you have to really be careful and, and apply every document you can find and, and analyze it correctly to see what's going on. Uh, let me say up front, this is the first paragraph. Be it enacted of the Act of May 5th, 1860, be it enacted that the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that, as provided for and consented to in the Constitution of the State of Nevada, all that territory and tract and land adjoining the present eastern boundary of the State of Nevada and lying between da 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 goes off on the on the tongues. All that all that territory uh, is to be added to the State of Nevada. Again, now the State of Nevada doesn't exist until after the Enabling Act. So. Keep this in, in chronological order as well. Then it says that there a section two, and be it further enacted by Congress now, not by Nevada, that there is hereby added to and made a part of the state of Nevada all that extent of territory lying within the following boundaries to wit. And they go through a whole discussion there. It happens to be all the, the Colorado River to California and all that. And I think this is the territory they're talking about. And then it goes on, and this is what caught my mind and started to get me thinking I had something wrong because I missed the detail. Because this statement made a conundrum. There's not supposed to be a conundrum in land disposal law or its uh, its grants or its uh, reservations. 
that and provided further that all possessory rights acquired by citizens of the United States to mining claims discovered, located, and originally recorded in compliance with the rules and regulations adopted by the miners. Remember, this is right before, right before the mining law. And so mining districts are governments here, and they're acknowledged again to be a, a regulating body on how miners did their thing, so essentially they wouldn't kill themselves. That's why mining districts got formed up. So this is pretty fascinating as well when you look at the history of all this. But there's an exception. It goes on, uh, discovered, located, and originally recorded in compliance with the rules and regulations adopted by miners in the Pa Ranagat and other mining districts in the territory, capital T, incorporated, incorporated by the provisions of this act into the state of Nevada shall remain as valid subsisting mining claims but nothing herein contained shall be so construed as granting a title in fee to any mineral lands held by possessory titles in the mining uh, states and territories. This is a fascinating statement. This one screwed me up. It tripped me up. I said, how can all this land, based on Cliven's presentation that it went to the state, retain an unstated reservation to the mineral estate, to the miners who located those things there, and by possessory title, which is another act of Congress that happened in 1865, subsequent to the state of the Nevada's uh, enabling act. And so I locked, got myself into a little bit of a conundrum. I even sent off an email. I said, well, we've got an interesting problem here. And then it occurred to me, my, the problem is my misinterpretation. I missed something. And I'm going to, without getting into the mining law and why that reservation is there, but that the minerals are always reserved. And that was the key and the clue that started to show me we had a problem, a different, two problems. I had to be able to analyze this to give reservation in the United States and, and try to give Cliven his uh, claim that the land went to the state and the people and without any guidance on how it would be disposed. When I know the Enabling Act was made to keep the state from having to do own the property because the people didn't want this hidden reservation of, of uh, in, encumbrance. And so here are you hearing, I'm telling, I'm admitting to you, I did the fundamental mistake that caused a question, but I wasn't too, too, uh, too arrogant and brash to say, wow, I got a real interesting problem here. How do I reconcile these problems in law? Unless I made a mistake. And so, let me go over to the act, uh, an act here that shows you that you need to have an express statement in an act to give the minerals to the state or a corporation. There has to be a specific designation. And this happened because they were given surface rights to companies and corporations and states, and they were, they were taking the minerals. Well, the minerals is a special estate. It really, really is a special estate. Uh, and it means your, it means your nation. You know, nothing comes out of that. Nothing you you have in your life probably uh, is made that it doesn't come from the land or from the minerals in the land. I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. That's how important this is. That uh, there's an act in the June 30th, 1865, and here's what it says. And this is what has to ride on the other one about the states or the count corporations getting any title to this land. It has to be expressed, and here's where it says it. Be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled that no act passed at the first session of the 38th Congress granting lands to states or corporations to aid in the construction of roads or for other purposes or to extend the time of grants hereto made shall be so construed as to embrace mineral lands which in all cases shall be and are reserved exclusively to the United States unless otherwise especially provided in the set in the act or acts gr uh, making the grant. Let me go back to the act of the borders. Did you hear a specific statement of the relinquishment of that reservation in 1866 to Nevada? That, okay, I'm, you should say no uh, if you didn't remember. No, you didn't hear it. It had to be here. What there was is a reservation of the title handling by the United States to its grantees, the miners. 
And so implied in here is a retention of the mineral estate because the state can't interfere with the existing rights of the miners and the minerals located. Now we start to get the problem. I interpreted it correctly. This is irreconcilable except for the claim of Butler, Clive and Bundy. So I still have a problem. How do we show where did the mistake happen? And it was me misinterpreting the very first part that I read to you. Did you catch it? Did you hear it, folks, when I read it to you the very first time I entered into this? Did you hear the condition on the boundary law that Cliven and the attorneys say gave the land to the people? Let me read it again to you. That, it's right up front, as provided for and consented to in the Constitution of the State of Nevada. Did you throw out and say, oh, well, we got a condition, we got to go check. That was my eye overlooked. I was so quick to run down and I wanted to see where the heck is he saying that they get the right to this land. Now, I'm telling you, my mind's saying it can't be. But I've got to prove it out. I've got to, maybe I missed something, right? Well, I did miss it in, a, in the negative to, to his position. And I, maybe I'm, I'm pushing too hard on, on you coming to the conclusion that maybe his, his position's not right. But we have to, one more place to go, folks. We have to go to the Constitution of Nevada. The, st the Constitution was granted for them to enact for the state itself and the government. Okay, you following, following this as well? We have to go back because this is the lineage of authority for this boundary. And we have to go back to the point in the Constitution. And I say, well, where is that? They don't even tell you what it is. And this is important for you to see. They'll refer to something and not tell you what it is. You have to understand the context, the 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 paramateria application of this. You have to learn how to apply all this law to know where to go look. And I said, well, I'm looking for something to talk about the undisposed lands. I'm looking for something that talks to uh, this uh, this right of disposition. And so I go in and my, you know, I'm looking around, fumbling around, and I'm going sideways to this whole thing instead of looking at it from the top to the bottom. And I start looking for public land. I'm looking for minerals. I start looking for this. And I found out when I looked at the minerals in Oregon, in, in, uh, in Nevada, uh, the minerals were taxed in 1889. I think you all folks, your miners over there, have a way to go at, uh, attack this. They don't have a right to take your livelihood. In 1989, that's a, this is when the, they started imposing all this nonsense against your private property. That's a crime right there, at least the way I see it. The way I can interpret this is, you just find the reservation to the state to tax your minerals and your work and your livelihood and everything that came with that grant, your ingress and egress. Do you see a right for the state to amend its constitution to steal by tax, to extort by tax your mineral estate? I don't. I think that's an absolutely unconstitutional provision, not the, or, uh, the Nevada Constitution against this, the disposition of the Constitution of the United States, and that the state forever disclaims a, tax, a, a right to it. You see how that works. Let me go back, and that's the point. Because right above this section, I finally found it. I go, how, how dumb have I been just to go, again, don't, don't hit these sideways. Go to top to the bottom. Find the point in the problem. With that they refer to in the in the Act of 1866 that is a condition upon it. It's a limitation upon it. What was it? And I read this part. It's in the ordinance that the people were required to make. Their constitution holds an ordinance, the ordinance that the Enabling Act required they would make in order to make it right. And it starts out interesting. In obedience to the requirements of an Act of Congress of the United States, Approved March 21st, A.D. 1864 to enable the people of Nevada to form a constitution and state gov government, comma, this convention, on and on. Let's go back to the first two words, in obedience. You think the people were sovereign? No, they had an obligation at least to this condition, this con this treaty. In obedience to this treaty, now we start, that's when I realized I, I'd missed something. Again, I don't study everybody everywhere. I just know what I'm looking for. It did take me maybe about eight, nine minutes to find this, finally, after I get past my own, my own obstacle. And guess what's listed here as part of the requirement that we read already in the Enabling Act, but that this, that part, portion of the, those parts of the Enabling Act had to be part of their constitution. And so we read again the limitation on the Border Act here, third, that the people, because here's the, let me remind you of the claim, that the people, the legislature never intended to cede the property. Well, we heard in the Enabling Act that wasn't the case, and their constitution for which the Border Act 
is conditioned says the same thing, that the people inhabiting said territory do agree and declare that they forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands lying within said territory, and that the uh, same shall be and remain at the sole and entire disposition of the United States. Is the limitation on the Border Act. Now, I need to ask you here, folks, I mean, in all honesty, did the people, did the people of the territory and the territorial government cede the land to this, of disposition of the United States? I have to have to tell you, they disclaimed the right and title to it. It had to be a session to that way, and they disclaim it for how long, folks? Forever. I don't know how you fix that against a claim that this land went to the states because of the border change, when the border change is subject to the Constitution, which had in it its enabling provision for the state itself. Now, I just went, that's pretty much, that's the proof, folks. I can go, there's so much more to discuss, but I wanted, again, I just wanted to get through the, the nubbins of this point. There's so much I could talk about underlying the why this has to be this way. I wanted to show you I was making mistakes and trying to come sideways to it, but that we come to a point when it all makes sense. There is no disagreement. There is not even a conundrum. If, given what I've shown you is the only thing and the right documents, and you would uh, analyze it or um, interpret it the same way. There's not a much of an interpretation, I don't think. This is what's going on. The Border Act is not a standalone act either. That's the paramaterial thing I told you about. The Border Act does not is not enacted without knowledge of the prior reservations and the prior prohibitions that Congress did not allow. And this comes, and this these provisions are come by the obedience of the people in that state. And so I guess I'm going to hold it open. I don't see how Cliven can support. The claim that he is trying to move, uh, and I think it's a United States District Court, again, not a court of competent jurisdiction over the matter, but they're going to go in there again. He's going to beaten up there all the time, doesn't quite figure out that out. How he can, his attorney can assert that this is lands that goes to the state and get a quiet title in their favor, I, I don't understand on a couple points. One, I, can, I can't find the authority. Even if it did, does Cliven have the right to, a uh, standing to do so? Would seem to me failed here. You, you may have to think about the state doing it. But why hasn't the state doing it came to my mind? Because they can't. The only thing that drives this whole thing is this wrong ideology that was created by Ken Ivory in Utah that the states, the solution is the states own the property. But you hear right there. They, they hear right in the enabling act. And this is consistent across the western states. What's not so consistent is this obedience thing and the disposition forever to the United States in the context of what it's done. This is actually, I would have to tell you that it appears that the Nevada Constitution the Enabling Acts do not allow the Nevada to come in on an equal footing that they also claim in the bid. They're supposed to come in on the equal footing, but to, when you read the subtle difference between this and some other states, this state was created during the time of the Civil War when they were trying to pull the Union together, uh, mon um, monopolize it, right, to remove the Union of countries and make it a more of the, the confederation of, of, of militarized imposition. So they took this as an obedience. There was not going to be a discussion about the, dis the ability to secede. That's another missed uh, point of footing equality. So I would look at this, and I, I'm not going to say in, until I would be able to research it. It looks on the surface that that Constitution, that state, that Enabling Act, did not bring the state in on equal footing, which they also claim. So... There's a lot of problems with this case. Uh, let me go up one more, actually. And let me go over to Title 28 of the Code, and they talk about real property quiet title actions. There's no In these articles, they don't tell you what they're coming under. So I'm making this stuff up as best that I can figure out how it works, but in my experience of how it ought to work, I'm going through and trying to pull up these things to make sense of it all. Well, I think I'm making sense of it. And it's not the sense that most people would make that are, um, well, that would speak contrary to what I'm saying. I, everyone wants to think about this property differently than it's really being dealt with. They want to think of a, of the condition differently than it's really is. 
Uh, they want to impute rights and property to things when the documents themselves don't even support it. And I don't understand what that's all about. But into this uh, Title uh, uh, 28, this is in Judicial Code now, how the courts will deal with these cases. In 2409A, Real Property Quiet Title Actions, there's a statement in here. Uh, remember, he also claimed he wanted quiet title to water, to water his cattle. He says, and, that's conjunctive. Well, I already know that his water rights are to him as an appropriate. The United States government has nothing to do with that because that water is, is granted for lawful uses and accepted before the law as a forbearance to the lawful use of water, as it did the highways, that it comes out not just a month later, two months later, and grants to the people the right to the water, appropriate water, and the right to the highway, the construction of the highways, that's a the Load Law of 1866, Section 8 and 9. This was all precipitated by a miner in 1864, uh, proving that the, the forbearance of the Congress is a grant. It works as a grant. You can't mess with people that way. You have to start paying them for what they, the, 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 the work they're doing, the property that they have. That possessory title you heard about, talked about earlier in this discussion in 1865. That's the acknowledgement. There's a possessory title to Men and women who go do work on the land and bring it to a, a lawful and good use. It's about land use at the point of production. But this section, uh, 2409, is it? Yeah, 2409. I'm cutting through the, through the part here. This section, remember, he went for what? Quiet title on water rights. And I looked at that and said, that's not how you do that. And it says right here, this section does not apply to trust or restricted Indian lands nor does it apply to or affect actions which may be or could be, could have been brought under these other sections. And so you got to go through all those things. But most import, importantly to, to all this, it says right up in the front part. So we've got a qualifiers underneath, and this is the first sentence. The United States may be named as a party defendant. This is the purpose for this statute in the judiciary. The United States may be named as a party defendant in a civil action under this section to adjudicate a disputed title to real property in which the United States claims an interest other than a security interest or water rights. So he can't even use, the attorney who put this forward can't use this section. I'm saying, you got to, this is another clue. You might use the other sections or a different remedy to challenge the United States and a different, a different relationship to challenge the United States. But using this quiet title section, you can't use it to vindicate your water rights. Why? Because those were already into the states. Those were already granted into the states, and they're held by you privately, not the state, not the county. And so here's another problem for this case. He's... He came by way of his dependency on the rights of the state and the county when there are none. I've told you before, you present the wrong question, you're going to get the right answer to this, folks. He is better put, and I've said this to a couple people on emails, that he should have made right, he should have brought his claim, his private claim, because that was the intention of the enabling acts with the disposition ceding the property forever. When the United States ceded it, when the United States did the acts to allow the disposition, as I've said before, in these acts is the fulfillment of this enabling clause to you, the people. Not to the state by virtue of the state or county authority, to you privately. Remember, it's exclusive to all. How can it be exclusive to all if you're dependent on the county? Is not the way this country was set up. What, the, what you have is that you can rely as a property possessor with exclusive rights. You can rely on the state or county rules in protection. And you may be subject, depending on whether you understand this, to the prerogative powers, if we hear that in the constitutions relative to eminent domain or uh, what's the other one, uh, police power. And I've told you how you define, how you defend that. Uh, the state laws are to protect. What's the water rights? The water rights are protected not because the states own the right, because they're sitting as the trustee overlooking over the chronolog chronological appropriation to make sure everyone has the water they have right to. 
They're supposed to be, these governments are supposed to be an inert position that does justice amongst people. They're the producers. Government doesn't do a dang thing. Now, why would he say, and I, I'm just, I was really shocked about this. He said this coming out of the, uh, he also said that coming out of that, that court. I'm going, what man, maybe the court messed him up. Uh, the, I mean, the jail, maybe the jail messed him up because it does that. Uh, how, how was he dependent on the county's rights or the state's rights? He has his own rights. That's what he's got to be quite entitled to. If that's the right answer, I don't even know that that's even the right answer. I'm just saying, based on all of this, based on all of this, I don't know what, he screwed this thing all up in his interpretation so bad. Again, we'd have to step, step back and say, wait a minute now, we've got to reconstruct this. So my advice, I mean, my observation to people of, uh, was, uh, unless he better situate, sorts this out, I think we're looking at a setup for a takedown. And I don't know whether intentional or not. I just see we are going to see a bad answer. No different than how you don't do an allocution. We're going to, you're going to be shown and, and you're going to be av- avoiding now how to do a quiet title action because you are so confused. You thought that he had all the rights in the world. And it's going to be clearly, I hope you could hear by my telling you, it's clearly in the documents that that didn't happen, what they're saying on the so-called you know, patriot side, whatever, the uh, freedom side. I don't know what you want to call yourself. I really don't know anymore. I'm 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 kind of confused at that. So at the point of of the of this this lawsuit, this action for the quiet title, I I, I'm, I think we're we're seeing a real problem. I think we're, I look at this as a stalking horse. Whether or not that's driven by the attorneys, or just ignorance, because as as they admit, as uh, I, um, Ken Ivory admitted, they just don't teach they don't teach us this land disposal law as attorneys. I don't know where they're going to get the information from. They didn't come up, come to us so we could uh, explain how. I, I, I'm instructing you how you go about understanding this land disposal law. You don't have to be an attorney. But all of a sudden now it's a rarefied place, and then they go do the wrong thing. And our experiences, and my experience particularly as I saw it, and then I've been able to show people that my colleagues as we moved in through this, our experience is the attorneys look for these matters in order to circumvent your understanding of property rights. Uh, I have some notes here I just remembered. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I got a highlighter that gives me ability to put notes, and I forgot about that as I'm doing this broadcast. But uh, one note was that I said the claim property is to him, not the government. Uh, so I'm going to repeat myself a little bit here, but uh, it's to him, not the government. All the government can claim is that his private property lies within its territorial jurisdiction for purposes of law enforcement or protecting his property or the rights under its laws. And so you, you see this as a whole different dynamic than the what he's imputing to how this actually works. And it's inverted, and it makes no sense. He thinks it makes sense. People around him make sense. I want him to think better. I don't, I'm not against Bundy here. He's a producer. He's a, he's a gallant guy. He's honorable in what he thinks he's doing. But I, I, I think, I hope I've shown you, he's under, uh, he's under a delusion, it seems. And I would have, I need people that is, can analyze this uh, where my error is, that they're going to have to talk to me about that and show me. I don't think I've really missed a step. It's not that complicated, actually. I think you heard me go right through the document uh, about that. Another note about this is, uh, and just because I was just responding from the article, and th- this become did become a little bit of a problem um, because I don't see the complaint. And to tell you the truth, I'm going to have to just... Uh, accept the liability to not having the time to read the complaint, but I don't know that I need to read it. Uh, if, given these things were stated, that uh, he stated that the man depended on Nevada and Clark County's rights to the land, and I'm uh, responding to somebody, uh, I'm not sure he has standing to assert state government or county rights to public land in saying this, quote, and other rights to the Nevada and its subdivision, Clark County, public lands in question. If you understand what's going on, the public lands are those federal uh, those uh, federal managed land, the public lands are managed by the federal, and they're yet to be disposed. They're not even under the county in the states. That's how it's by definition. So his his own statement is saying the public lands exist. Counters his assertion that the state owns the lands or the county has right to them. They only have that coordination right, as I understand this. Again, someone's going to have to explain to me how what my interpretation of all this is wrong, where it's wrong, how it's wrong, and how how that he's going to have to set his case up better than what I hear him doing it. Uh, as I wrote down numbers here, and I think this, yeah, this was an email. Uh, the claim property is to him, 
not the government. It isn't public land, but public domain he claims privately, notwithstanding the multiple uses coexisting on the public land, i.e., those parts of the land not yet disposed by some law. Number two, all the state governments can claim is that the private property lies within the inter territorial jurisdiction for purposes of law enforcement or for protecting its property or rights under its laws and for his reliance or for purposes of an applicable state prerogative power. And those of you that I may have responded to that, I wanted you to understand that, and I didn't define, I didn't expand on that, that state applicable state prerogative power is where they you find out they really don't have this prerogative power against certain properties and grants. It only extends only so far. Number three, I, I made an observation, hopefully trying to explain what the problem was here. Any rights the state, uh, any rights the state or county may have, whether the public land or public domain, is theirs to protect, not Bundy's. As far as I understand, quiet title actions in responding this quickly with uh, without more study. And so I make the observation and quick review uh, seems to indicate he can't get there from here unless he gets things sorted out better. And that, I'm holding to that, folks. I said that way before I even did the study. But it not just that, now I'm actually to the point, it's going to have to be sorted out so much better, he can't make the claim to a state or county authority in the property. He's going to have to revert to his property and acquire quiet title to all that he possesses, exclusive of everybody else. And as I said that, I think that's as concise as I can show you how this has kind of been done wrong, and I think we're looking at a setup for a takedown, and it's going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us at the point of our, it hurts the people, because the people were the beneficiary of this treaty agreement between the Congress to dispose, the state to cede, the Congress to dispose to public, to private uh, use, so that the title, of our title and land could not be interfered with by either government. I'm pausing because I want people to think about this. It's not that it's not that complicated. It's not really that that that, that involved. What happens is people get involved, they hear something, and they don't really dig in and deep down deep and figure it out. They just kind of run with the best next idea, and this is what's been killing us. It's killed us. It's the 30 years I've been doing uh, look 30 35 years I've been looking at this. That's what's killed us. And when I learned more about <laughs> learned more not to do all that stuff. The things just started changing. I just can't tell you. We got, again, the county, one of the counties we work with, they're doing stuff that is just so great, uh, fantastic. They're actually doing stuff to protect the people in the capacity of the county to protect the people's property rights, the people's right to the road, interfering with the Forest Service, absolutely going after them after the Forest Service dug up a road to stop the miners, actually, essentially, from accessing their claims is now, uh, now in the face, I just found out just on the face of a, of a demand to put the road back into a to a tune of three over three hundred thousand dollars. That wasn't happening before we, we before when we weren't doing this or when we had the wrong idea, and that was before that was happening. The county was like attacking people and allowing the Forest Service to hold uh, the federal government to go on the on the on the highway in the public land, the highway in the public land interfere with that ingress and egress, which is under state law, no different than the water. Let me bring up another concept. So the county is protecting that. Another concept. Water is another big word I'm going to use here. Contemporaneous. Water is contemporaneous with mineral, mineral production. In other words, they're like Siamese twins. The purpose for the water grant for the, for the purpose of the miner is not separable. Your right of ingress and egress is a contemporaneous right to the property. When you start having this kind of correlation and, and consistency, you need to be looking at why and the power and the fact. When you look at it right, there is no intrusion in there by government. It sits to, supposed to sit to protect all of it. Contemporaneous is a Siamese twin and a Siamese twin. And a, you know, I only have how many times can you bring together a pertinent rights in one function other than in the law of the land? That is not supposed to be interfered with. And wherever you go, you'll find the savings clauses. You'll find the directives, the delegations to the government to protect it all. You'll find the exceptions to the interference of it by government, as I've shown you in, in the other, another state, Oregon. Go into Jefferson Mining District, get on the highways and trails, and you'll see right at uh, 368, 131, 
They might be able to adjust these roads, but they can't interfere with the underlying grant to the grantees. It doesn't say grantees, to those that took the law of the United States, accepted the law of the United States in their construction of the highway. This is just not supposed to be interfered with. We have a county now going after the Forest Service for doing just that. How that plays out, it's going to be interesting to watch. It's never happened before. It wasn't happening when we weren't doing this. When we started to look at this and be, be the ones that were the witness to the crimes, it started to change. Now, I'm putting a lot of, beyond faith, I mean, just the experience, I'm putting my experience right out front on this to explain that when it started to look wrong, there was a big misunderstanding. And I'm suggesting to you, like the stocking horse problem, the attorneys look for that division in you, that misunderstanding to exploit. Doesn't, doesn't at all, you won't even see the problem. And this is where I found at least what I have to say for those that will listen. Uh, is the power. We we see the transparent. It's not transparent. It's just that you have to have the eyes to see it. You have to have the foundation to spring from. You have to have, I, I have to say that I had the humility in myself to say, I mean, I may not know this when this is research, and then I made it, a, I, I went down the track, I tried to prove the track of somebody else, and, and it started to fall apart. And I go, wait a minute, I'm all confused a bit. Now, this this doesn't really hold up. And I went back to my set rule. If it's not holding up, I missed a step. I'm going to re- so I'm reiterating how this path went. So I had to go back to the beginning of the document I was reading, and I said, oh, yeah, I overlooked this condition. The condition was actually the Constitution that says, you don't get the property. You forever disclaim right and interest in it. Wow. So don't make a, a, a quiet title action because it's not going to go your way. Go to quiet your rights to the property in its use. That is consistent with the law. If he has an impertinent use that extends beyond his possession into forage on the federal land, that's something else he gets to assert. Whether he wants to do that in the United States Circuit Court, uh, uh, United States District Court in Nevada, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why he would want to do that. We're almost we're at the point of talking claims issues, and that's the Court of Claims. That is an Article Three court in an equity condition. Why is it a USDC court? I don't have a clue. And I've been asking everybody to challenge those things right. Even Ryan could have done so. But he wouldn't have done it by making it up, by dismissing the authority. It would be by properly challenging the authority and imposing an obligation and duty as a matter of law, not his opinion. And why, when I say that, I go, why is this stuff so hard to understand? That people, 22 people would listen to me only last week on a straw man weaponization. And it's what I'm talking about here, folks. They're creating straw men, and then they're going to burn. They're going to torch them. And you're going to think, oh, well, that was not a straw. You think it's a, a, a man of a, a mind and a man of heart and a man of spirit. And they've just set up a straw man. They torched it, the effigy. That's a person. It's an effigy. And they're going to torch it in this case. And for all his goodness, Clive and Bundy will have been the instrument of that destruction. As I analyze it today before you, Real time, as I put my, just put up the links to look at. Can I be in error? I have to always hold out. I don't think I am in this case. But I have, to, those of you that have a better thought, I don't want to get no argument. You just, it's real simple, folks. I told you, just sentences. You have a proof, you can do it in sentences to me. And I'll, I'm certainly going to look at it. We need to know. I've told you this before. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong in a big way. If I'm not wrong, we got big problems. But we're being exploited and no one's looking at that either. So, kind of drew this out just a little bit. It's that important. I'm concerned. If if you think I, my view has anything, any bearing at all, notwithstanding all those that of you that are uh, call me names, it's okay. That's a mirror. I'm a mirror. I'm just a mirror here, folks. Really, uh, I have my own my own thing I do. And if I ask you to go do something and you don't want to do it, you call me names instead. That's fine. I have no more time for that. Uh, I can't help that either. That, must, that means that you agree with a uh, contorted view of, uh, of a society that uh, it, none of the laws exi- show that exist. It's the only one that's foisted on us. It's how this thing gets taken, has been used to take us down. The attorneys are critical to this point. So I'm going to start getting a lot critical on, on, Bun, on, on Clive and Bundy here, but I don't mean to do that. So I'm going to move on uh, into moving into the tabs. We've got a little bit more time here. Uh, and I, again, I hope uh, 
There's an analysis that you can go back on the archives and listen to. You can get the links. I absolutely suggest go into the blogcast or get the links. Put the tabs up on your thing and go through them as I have them listed. And you'll see, you'll go right through them and you'll be able to find in those documents. They're not that long. Where I was reading, you can stop, pause, start, pause, return, pause, until you can read where I was reading. Some of the documents you can actually take, some of the you can take a copy and paste. You can build this proof for yourself and then go back and listen to what I said with it. And you can prove out for yourself whether or not a quiet title action attempted by a private party for a state or, or county interest is actually feasible in law. And any of you that see that it is, I need to hear from it. I need to know how I miss something. So, I hope that, I hope that, say, I mean, it, I'm just saying this is the problem. And if you solve this thing, you start to get this idea in your mind, it will start orienting the law that everyone denies exists and it's been avoided all this time because we don't know. We're ignorant of it. It brings it all. It brings your life into a better organization and and it brings a peace upon things. And then you can identify those that are trying to breach that peace. And this was a breach of the peace. This action to quiet title for the state dependent uh, on, on rights dependent possession and rights of use dependent on a county, on a state that never was supposed to be, was a breach of that peace. If I can say it that way as well. And so that breach of the peace drives me. It shouldn't be a breach. There should be peace. There should be settlement. And all we've been seeing is, is destruction, is lack chaos. So, uh, again, I just I don't know. It's such a deep thing, I don't even know what to say about it. I wish more people were on point of it, and they would just roll their sleeves up and find a pro- this kind of a project. And I think they would they would be more uh, amenable to what I've been saying and how to go about this stuff. It's not that hard. It's just that you have to get oriented correctly. You have to stop the stories in your mind. You have to stop being persuaded by someone else's assertions. Now, I can agree to, agree with you that I, had I not been studying the mining law and this property stuff for quite a few years, when uh, the Ken Ivory's Road Show came through town and I went to see it, I would have probably been overwhelmed by it. I mean, oh, well, this, yeah, yeah, a little applaud, golf clap, let's move, let's do it. But as I told you, I identified in his presentation six major flaws. And man, that thing took off. It was a surprise to us that it took off, but it did, because people want to end the pain. I said this before. I've done a broad broadcast. Just stop the pain. You just want to stop the pain. You don't care how. You don't care if it diminishes you one little bit. You, you know what you know because you know it, but it's not. And this is my main problem with all of this. It has been for many, many, many years. And so, moving on. In this land of the free, which is not, we're f- we see the fruition of it all. And uh, this becomes, a, again, a certain aspects of, of understanding the condition. Some things you might adjust, some you can't. Remember, you have the right to move on the road. But if you, acqu- uh, but if you uh, agree to commercial use, maybe you might have just relinquished something there or bring yourself susceptible, which requires that you do extra work in order to flesh that out and get it clarified. Uh, in the continuing oppression and the pre- appearance of the military force in our lives that has been here for a long time, under the skin, people didn't really realize, they didn't need to make it any tougher until they wanted to make more controls and get and be able to show that they can force people and, and in like these set bad precedents so that no, the next prairie dog won't put its head up. And for those of us that would and have the right argument, it's easier for the other side to diminish what we say because it's another thing we get. And then we get the denial and the, the wall of silence, which I've shown you we now can, we bore through pretty quickly based on the, on a duty that's owed in their official capacity becomes a false representation of whatever they're representing it is another way through to bring the witness and the record to the fact that uh, we're now seeing more witness and record to the fact of your, you live in an open air prison, a daily citizenship checks in quotes on buses across Maine highlight constitutional free zone. And this is revisiting re, uh, the idea that the courts have allowed uh, border patrol to have a an extension of a minimum of 100 miles from any border. That includes the entirety of the coasts as well. 100 miles in, and I've seen cases that went to 120 miles. I've seen one, I thought, to 150 on a very particular thing. 
that there's a it's coming out again now that the government is coming in and asking doing citizenship checks. So this is a whole other kind of a deal. It opens up a whole bunch of problems. What I want to focus on, at least on the beginning, this is a militarized encroachment using the pretext of a border check in order to do it. A U.S. Border Patrol is running daily citizen checks on buses traveling from Fort Kent toward the state's interior and making periodic checks on buses originating in Bangor. Our purpose for boarding any conveyances was a motor vehicle here. It was a conveyance, any of them. A bus specifically in this case, oh, that's an interesting now limitation because a bus is defined as one of these motor vehicles, these regulated conveyances, uh, would, and this is under, again, where, folks? I'm just making this stuff up. No, go right to Title 18, uh, Section 31, and Sub 10, and you'll see it discussed. These motor vehicles, they're a commercial vehicle. Uh, would be to question anybody, anybody about their right to be or remain in the United States, whether they are alien or not, says Hebert, chief patrol officer. Uh, That's kind of the gist of it. We would have to have a reasonable suspicion to think that somebody isn't a citizen to continue questioning was the very all-important caveat. So, though the title says, they are doing these routines. They throw in that they know they have a limitation. And there has to be some connection that they have reasonable cause to believe you're not a citizen. And so now you need to go and find out how you more properly address this point about the probable cause to believe, the articulable basis that they're using to suspect you're not this citizen uh, that can't be forced to do any of this. But we see this as the article goes through. It discusses this fishing expedition. It questions the the overthrow of the Fourth Amendment. But if it's a constitutional free zone, which is an impossibility, this is a pretext the courts have set up. But you know it wasn't constitutional free if they admit, and this is out of their own words, and this is one of the proofs you would get from their documents you'd have with you, you talking your traveling bag of law, was that they admit They have a constitutional limitation. So the title of the article is missing the point as well. I wanted to point this out because in this land of the free, you live in an open-air prison. You open-air prisoner. Cricket. This only happens because everyone's quiet. And there's a limitation, and you're going to have to know about it. And no different than there's a right way to do, uh, do the allocution, right of allocution, whether or not you get anything. You've now set a good record. Or a bad way is up to you. I'm asking us to to do better. And this, analyzing this, it helps us to be prepared in the areas 100 to 120, even 150 miles from any border, including the coastal areas. From this sort of imposition, and this is particular now to to uh, the bus, which I would assume is a carriage, uh, a passenger carriage or profit, for profit and hire. Now, the problem I have is, is what did most people do? Is they, well, let me identify you, and uh, even if you didn't care, what would you provide for him as ID? You provide for him a commerce certificate called your driver's license or your your photo ID, which comes under the same authority. Am I making that up? No, go look at your, your, local, te- your local state laws, and you'll see it's all a commerce authority. In other words, Congress regulates the commerce of the, Congress regulates the commerce of the nation, and the states have to comply. You think you're sovereign states? Go look at it again. And so everything the state does on the motor vehicle, because their your rights to use the ingress and egress are granted to you, and they can forever disclaim a right to interfere with you by your enabling act, they are only regulating commerce. So when you are asked for your ID, it's your straw man ID. It's that thing they made up that you made up that you applied for. You told them you existed as a straw party, and now you're going to be treated as one. That's not a violation of your constitutional rights, then. And so I get it's a different way to look at all this. You're going to have to, those of you that are out and about are going to have to consider how much you want to push this, how much you're going to prepare. The bag of law has, you make up a particular bag of law for traveling. 
uh, and, and it works. Jefferson Mining District, we have one for the highways and trails. We have one uh, at a sus supplement for the highways and trails. We have the bag of law for the miners. Look and see how that's constructed. Have one for yourself. Carry it with you. That's your passport. No, we won't passport with it, but you're going to be able to possibly thwart this intervention, and you're going to be asserting yourself in a more proper way. I've asked you to go to the to whoever's doing this, the DHS, and ask for their policy on how what their basic for basis for the probable cause is, so you can have that with you. See, if I'm presumed, given I'm presumed innocent, and I'm presumed of being innocent in do in my conduct, they have a much higher uh, standard to meet than just pretext say so. And it's not, am I detained? Is that answering the pre, the, 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 the caveat of reasonable suspicion? Absolutely not. And so pay attention to how you address these things. If you do it wrong, they'll suck you up quick and you won't have the record and they're justified. Like Ryan Payne. If you bring the wrong action based on someone else's rights or rights that aren't actually viable, you will set a precedent that's no good. You will not. You will spend a lot of time and energy doing the wrong thing when you should have went down the right path and asserted you protect your own stuff. You don't worry about the rest of everybody else's. You set the example for the rest of the everybody else so in case they don't know, they can see. But you go out and you purposely, by ignorance or whatever or by plan, make the wrong thing. It's no different than the Rosa Park matter. They set that up to have an outcome they needed. Do you think that stops because you think you have a right that you misinterpreted? So, there's a critic critique about the violation of the Fourth Amendment. I'm saying most people don't understand how it works, given it might work, but that if it doesn't work, you have another, um, you, you need to create the record that allows you to, to have the cause to out it. And so you help expose how. How. Not the wrong mythical creature called the United States that the, is a fr imaginary friend of the prosecutor. Not that way. In, in substance. So, there's a critique down here. I'm not so sure it's valid. I think it's because uh, if you don't listen to the caveat that you have a right of innocence and they have a reasonable, they have to have a reasonable suspicion, if you understood how that dynamic was going to be, uh, you would have that as your first presentation of trying to get you to divulge yourself and then how why are you being required to hand over an ID that's not actually required in law, that's in commerce? Why are you being forced to associate with it as a commerce entity just to use the highway you have a right to use just because you use someone who, who you're going to pay to, to carry you? Who is regulable on their side? In other words, the mere riding on a bus is probable cause enough? That's not probable cause, obviously. And so you got to work this out. You have to get the dialogue going, uh, letter writing, in order to get this ferreted down. I don't think it takes too long, but you have to start to do it if you want to be one of those people that have an example to be for the rest because we're just that ignorant about all these things. We just are. So we're, we're in this military consequence. We want to deny it. We're thrown into commerce, which throws us into a very particular part of the military. We get into the admiralty and the merchants and things like that and contraband. Why do you think they can take your stuff under forfeiture? Because it's contraband to something you were doing in commerce. It's, it's presumed against you. Is that a constitutional violation? No, because you've offered it in as an application to you. You've you consented it away. You can't give somebody something either. I mean, like Cliven, given the state and the state and the county. Property that they clearly disclaim forever? Please. I mean, does anybody have a have a clear thought on that other than that? I mean, they all think, oh, yeah, we got to protect the Clive and Bundy on this. Oh, we got to protect this or that and the other. Oh, the government's bad. Government's going to be a neutral right here. It's going to tell you, give, you're going to bring a wrong, uh, the wrong answer, the wrong question to a court, which shouldn't have been a question. They're going to give you the right answer. And it's not going to be good and not going to look good. And that's going to defeat him. More importantly, it defeats him in his other rights, his other property that ought to have been done correctly. And not in a USDC court, territorial court, where there's no territory, unless it's this fictional territory, this veneer, this district you hear about. 
pretty pretty interesting what we allow and then complain about. So uh, anyway, I wanted to point out the militariness of this is coming down. They're now getting on and asking for you to prove your citizenship. Tell you the truth, folks, I don't know what document the government issued me to prove that. You ever think of that as a problem for them? Think about what I'm saying here, folks. If you've never been issued a document, you can't present it if they demand it. They don't have the right to demand it. You better have a, a phrase or something or a proof in your, in your pocket in order to explain that to them. And then you're going to have to tie it back over to an extortion or a coercion. That's the felony crime. And you kick them outside of the scope of their duty or their office, whatever they think they're doing. And now you got yourself a record that starts standing a lot better. And, it's, and in particular, when you do your independent collateral, your non-dependent collateral attack to all this. And as I say, independent correction to non-dependent, Solomon came to mind. I understand he called. I didn't get to hear the, the, but a bit of it. I'm, I'm kind of waiting to at the after the broadcast maybe to hear hear that. Hopefully RLM will have it up. Uh, but yeah, contributor to our psyche and our thoughts. Thank you, Solomon. Just to let you know, I sounded like you're doing pretty good as I thought about that. But the non-dependent collateral attack against this is set up by your record. You don't have any of that right now. And most people will argue about this and whatever. Again, whatever. I don't really. I'm getting to the point. I don't really know. Uh, to bother myself anymore. I can't say I don't care because I do care. I do I do care that you're going to get yourself in trouble or you're going to be a cricket and be an accessory to the crime against you and become a victimization problem, an example of that. And that's probably the worst one of all. As I'm saying, the prairie dogs find out, oh, we don't want to go out, out there with the eagle come and take us down. And, and it was because you set your problem up wrong. So the, the martial constraints come on, uh, financial, uh, there's a, there's the physical travel that they, they uh, uh, they try to curb. They have been curbing. Uh, there's the possession of the property that you don't understand how to present right to get uh, to to stop their their encroachment. Then you know. Then they have they come around and they can interfere with you. They do the monetary thing. That's how the main thing how they they treat you. And this is why I've been moving. I'll be moving over to this. Uh, what I consider this is like another martial extension. You see, it's global. This this thing I talked about in the United States that happened. We can identify. This is the global control, and then it has a veneer on top of that. That's this globalist control. And they understand us better than we know ourselves. And so we, and, and all this, I talk about this over and over. We move over now to this other threat I think I see all the time. Uh, I'm really and partly not interested, but I just see more and more people uh, being enthralled and want to engage it, aren't making any discussion on how to avoid it, uh, that I want to keep maybe pressing. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Grimner says he'll post that tomorrow. I appreciate that. Uh, and again, as Solomon was sounding a whole lot more energetic. If I, what bit I did here, well, then last time, so I was hope I was uh, that made me smile a little bit. I hope that's the case. But uh, getting back to this, uh, your control of your life, you're controlled where you travel. You don't understand you're in commerce. Here's fiscal, financial stuff. It's in commerce. All this stuff you don't understand how to distance yourself, or you don't have a body of a body of proof. And I don't mean this on and on. You know, you don't have the, like the bag of law is quite extensive, but you only need like the first two or three sheets to shut down the whole thing. Again, let's me go to the core of that quickly. If the states forever disclaim any property in the territory and the Congress granted it back to you, isn't that really all you have to tell somebody? That if they violate that, they come in conflict with the laws of the United States? That, let's say, the Act of 1866 load law says nothing comes in conflict with this act, which we've used against the local sheriff on the stream bed on the river. How are your acts not in conflict with this law? That was all, folks. That was it. It was over. First of all, we relied on their ignorance. They didn't have a clue. But there was no way they could interfere with that grant. And they didn't. And that actually gave us an open door to the sheriff at the time a few years ago. And when he got on board, he got kicked out of office. You see how this works. So we need deeper, deeper impression going on. But anyway, so finances is a again the, the the producer makes wealth. The real wealth comes from nature and and and, and what nature provides and, and your your good stewards. I can use the word stewardship of it. How you you get it out correctly. Uh, don't don't exploit it. But the commerce side of this is really where your lives are constrained. And this uh, South Korea considers taxing cryptocurrency transactions financements. So from banning them, I told you they're probably going to tax them if they're not banning them. Sure enough, you see. That their uh, soul is considering the introduction of taxes on cryptocurrency transactions in an effort to back 
hold back excessive speculative speculative investment in virtual currencies. Enough said there. Uh, this is what they're going to do. This, you're plugging yourself into all this this system. Uh, somehow, I, I still say, if you don't privatize your uh, your um, uh, cryptocurrency, so-called, and really privatize it, it's going to be one of those controls. And if it's found out to be an anonymous thing and it's in a commercially uh, viable entity, it'll be controlled or closed down or stolen. Bitcoin's high value has ruined it as a medium of exchange. A fascinating little discussion on how, as I told you before, it gets so high you can't use it locally. And then you get into this problem that it takes so long to run the Bitcoin uh, the, the transactions through, which is another another thing that's coming out that's trying to solve that. And I hear now they're doing maybe a million transactions a second now. But I don't know about that. My point is that they know they have problems to get you to buy in. But the bottom line is, is it's all a controllable constraint. Value is speculation no matter how you do it because of the way this was created. So word to the wise, caution on how this works uh, then you have now already the fallout because of this dynamic, the speculative nature, the fact that it, the transactions are costing more money. Uh, I talked about it last week. Ending Bitcoin support was a Stripe.com uh, blog post, and they're not going to be taking uh, cryptocurrencies. They say uh, they say uh, that they'll they're not not adverse to it. They actually embrace it, but because of the transaction time and the cost and the problem with the value, they can't. As a business, they can't deal with it. If you're on the other side of that, folks, how are you going to pay for your services? You can't buy into this one thing, as I guess is the point there as well. Uh, then you find on the banking side, where the government does have the regulation already, and we've already talked about this, is again another, another company doing this, but actually pushing more. They're going to get their stuff. They're going to get their big data if you continue to be plugged in and don't find an alternative, the non-dependent alternative. Uh, that was uh, the foundation of our life, that real law of the land, and what we derive from it, and how we work amongst each other in, in promoting ourselves and, and helping each other in that. MasterCard pushes biometrics. Uh, banks follow. Wow, where's the leader right there? Bio, MasterCard. Biometric authentication will be a great benefit to everyone. Close quote. You know where that's going. This is predict. I predicted this was coming, folks. If no one else saw it, and someone else, you know, some of you did. I'm not saying I'm the only one. I'm telling you, a long time back, I was saying, watch this stuff out. This is all silent weapons for quiet wars, folks. I don't know how many people were talking about that then and I'm tying it together with how. It was so important. I did multiple broadcasts reading from the document parts. I, I couldn't repeat the pictures, okay? So, I've, that's how important this all was then and before. I just was able to, I decided to go ahead and take the time it took to read that out so you could hear it. If you did, I hope you heard it. Uh, but MasterCard has set a deadline for widespread use of biometric identification from its sources across the whole of the EU. So this is the test. What is the, in the, in the America, what is already what's going on in that is nothing more than the uh, real ID. That real ID, again, is a commerce authority. It's a national database, and we've heard all about this stuff. They're going to tie all this biometrics into it, all right? So here, it's there. Here's the the writings on the wall on your financial existence in the future. Ha and here's the other threat, another vulnerability. Again, hackers stole 1.2 billion worth of cryptocurrencies over the last decade already, folks. I'm going to ask you again: What's in your wallet? You'll be lucky if it's a moth, even a virtual one. In fact, that's what's going to happen. These are probably going to be, as I've said this before, they're going to get so creative. When you open your wallet, a butterfly, a graphic butterfly will fly across the screen. That's what's in your wallet. We hacked $1.2 billion worth of so-called value out of these things. Um, what happens when the government want to gets in on the deal? You're going to pay your taxes to it and a fine and a fee, and maybe you're going to be put into involuntary servitude as we're finding out a story from inside the system. Um, interesting story. Extortion, police raids, and secrecy inside the Venezuelan Bitcoin mining world. Fascinating discussion on how people are foregoing their, uh, because it's just so bad, they're foregoing the threat. They have to watch how they do this. Uh, they, the guy explains a lot of things on how you go about doing make, running a Bitcoin miner and how you go about doing uh, living in a place where the currency is debased. You have problems in the politics. You've got external forces trying to kill your country, uh, the, the nation or your people, the government in the nation, so it hurts you. Uh, 
what it takes is, is here. And if you get caught, what the government's willing to do in this oppressive condition in order to actually use your stuff to benefit the government itself. Pretty fascinating. This is what we may have to, to, to see as we move forward. What stops the government from confiscating, forfeiting yourself, your stuff, your Bitcoin miners, and, and, because there's a law that says if you're anonymous, you don't get to have it, and they start their own Bitcoin mining centers as they are doing and are speculated that they're doing, the police are doing in the uh, in Venezuela itself, that the offices, the police officers have Bitcoin mining installations in them to mine Bitcoins from equipment they've confiscated. Just blocked theft everywhere, a blockchain that's blocked theft. Canada testing digital ID system that uses blockchain biometrics to screen travelers. I don't know, folks. I don't know what I can tell you how accurate I've been, I've been on how this progresses. And I've told you, if I don't get it out of my mouth one week, it almost comes out of the news the next. Here, this, this is all integrated with the government. All this blockchain technology, these Bitcoin speculation, it's a cover. It's the stocking, the stocking crypto coin. It's the stocking coin. They do, they want you involved. They want you to engage. What they got behind this, it's coming. That you're going to have to have some kind of an ID that they've pushed put on you. And if you don't have that uh, that phone, and if you don't have this ID, and you don't have all your biometrics in that database, you're gonna they're gonna make up the idea of pulling you off your dang bus, and then you get to sit around for a while uh, indefinitely. Remember, uh, while they figure things out. So. Uh, all this is on the on the front. I'm asking us to take a step back and get back to the roots of the land and work from there and do that part right. I seriously don't believe that uh, Cliven Bundy understands the harm he's going to do, at least the way I pointed it out to you, that he will do when he tries to execute on this and he is, they give him the right answer to his wrong question because it was a question and it was not supported anywhere. Uh, what are they using uh, to continue all this this issue? And this is something I had to deal with. Uh, um, as I told you uh, last week, mentioning how you combat the straw man, I said you, you have to uh, fortify and shield all the ways they can come at you, uh, your, your castle, so to speak, that, that you have to have uh, defenses, or anticipatory defenses. You have to anticipate the, how they, uh, well, that's how you look at how your experience will tell you how they will try and come at you to defeat your position. You have to have statements within your documents in order to block all those those possibilities and you can only do to the limit of your knowledge about that one of the exceptions that they do that is very powerful very hard to get around is something called a good faith a uh, good faith exception uh, to the fourth amendment that the bar association attorneys through your so-called judges in the supreme court have allowed as encroachments so that is what you have to speak to you have to eliminate any possibility of good faith ever. It's getting so bad you've heard that the law, on the one side, the, the cop can get the law wrong, and he's got a good faith exception to take your stuff, take you out, take put you somewhere, get, and then you go through the process. So one of the things that I found it interesting that came up after I had done my uh, uh, the project, uh, or at least got it uh, uh, completed uh, for, for the next step, was dealing with what we hear here, here in this article was the good faith exception. Uh, exceptions. You have to put those, those are like the savings clauses to the military's encroachment on you. You have to understand a lot of those. You have to look and see what the courts are doing and kind of keep up with that. Uh, this would come in on just on all this, on the Bundy thing, on this, like the seven mile, all of this. It, everything they do, they try to come in and they try to just, they try to set up a record of a good faith and exception. You have to be aware of that. You can circumvent it very quickly. In other words, how did I do it with the confrontation I just explained to you with the sheriff on the bank while we were doing mining in a river? It's supposed to be a wild and scenic river, and it was supposed to be uh, untouchable. And I asked him what? To defeat him. I asked him, how does your authority not come in conflict with this law granting us the right to do this right here? How does your authority not come in conflict? I took away his good faith exception. I posed another law he was supposed to know. I'm pausing. This stuff is powerful if you understand it. If you're not quite up to speed on it, you don't quite appreciate it. You, I need, I, you need to slow up and listen. When I pause on that one, that just struck me to just shut up. I'll shut up right here for a second. I just said you get rid of this good faith exception by proposing a question how their authority isn't in conflict with a law you know gives you the right to do something. 
But this article goes on and talks about this, and you need to really know about it. It talks about uh, um, a third-party doctrine, again, as we talked about it before. You need to see how this all works out. Although, I found out that uh, local radio communication from like a phone, I was looking at something else and popped up, uh, from a radio phone, that's recognized as not a broadcast under the wiretapping. So someone who uses that against you, you can have evidence suppressed because of that, because they're not supposed to wiretap your your uh, conversations. These are these exceptions. This is what this story starts to talk about, that the cops relied on one of these types of things and that they were not properly reliable. And the good faith exception then could not apply. This is a very important concept and uh, or imposition that we have to learn about that to me looks like the gu- the military occupation just handing them handing them uh, the protections for the soldiers to hurt you as it says in the Libra code and again you can disagree you can try to find all the reasons how it doesn't work i'm telling you experientially when i started looking at the world this world they call us you know the free land of the free i started looking at it like this i'm able to protect myself and others a whole lot more under that delusion than any other one other one I might cut have. Let's put it that way. Okay, so it's just a way to approach our problem. I'm not I'm not sure what the total answer is. I just know we're making we're making headway uh, on different and doing things differently. Uh, this exception was very important. I wanted to tell it to you because it, I found it interesting. It all popped up when I was dealing with it within the context of a project on a collateral attack and making sure that I anticipatory the defenses they might brought up, I could shut them all down. Everyone I could conceive of, I had to shut down. I don't want them d- diminishing what I'm doing. And, so, and you don't want them diminishing what you're doing. You don't want to give them the excuse. You don't want to give anybody who might give them the excuse the excuse. That's how the level of depth of analysis that starts to happen. And it doesn't happen, you don't have to say lots. It's really in short little sentences as well. So, uh, anyway. All depends on if you're going to get involved. If you're not going to get involved, or if you get involved and in the wrong way, you take on a idea that isn't proper, and you support people that are good-hearted and good-natured. Listen, I don't. I'm I'm concerned for Clive and Bundy. Actually, I'm concerned for his property. Concerned for his family. I'm, I'm concerned that I'm almost hoping he got set up. I'm almost hoping that's why an attorney's so close to him. But the way they're going, I can't see. And again, Mark on the Beast, Yahoo.com. I. I need to see where my mistake was. If that's wrong, what I just showed you simply in three documents, not even three, it's only in one document you have to go to see what they're talking about is incorrect. And I want them to focus on their property that they have claimed. That's their power, not to the through the dependence of the government. Your own right as a man and woman on the land. You want to talk about man and woman on the land, free man on the land? That's how you're getting at it. You're not talking as a title. You're talking it as a title, uh, I mean, as a, as a title like you have a, a put it on top of a piece of paper, it's a, the landed title. It's the patent or the as patent right that the government can't intrude. Why? Because they've disclaimed all interest and right forever on the state side and in the government it's a trust obligation to fulfill in disposal to you. And didn't I just say a mouthful there if you didn't hear it, folks? I just got to call your attention to some of the stuff people I think just don't understand. It's right there so easy. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said uh, gives a clarity to certain things. Uh, it gives you some empower, empowers you to do something. Go find something wrong you want to make right and get you to step forward on that. Grimner, thank you very much for what you do. RealLibertyMedia.com on the uh, broadcaster and the site and the whole thing and all the other hosts that are um, allowed to be there to continue our, our uh, little our little foray into the oppression. And uh, Jules at uh, UCY.TV, thank you very much for what you do over there and all the work you put out. Appreciate the communication and uh, anybody else at uh, Minds.com, BitChute, a small amount of YouTube, disappointed, but that's okay. There's not that many people that are impressed uh, with having to step up with their responsibility. I can't change that either. But thank you very much. I'll be here next week. Tech diffs are nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs> 